Good morning, Dubuque. Good to see you. It's a beautiful morning. It's always a great uh, Dr. King breakfast. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This is a special day uh, in the life of our community. At least it has grown that to be that for me. I hope it is for you. Uh, when I look out at this group of people, uh, I see a group of people who are really important. Uh, you're important because you're here, uh, but you're also important because I, I just have this sense that many of you uh, care about our community. Uh, you serve as volunteers in uh, many venues in our community. Uh, we have elected officials here, uh, educators, uh, lawyers, bankers, uh, police folks, teachers, pastors, clergy, all that, uh, students. So thank you for being here this morning. Uh, again, it's going to be a great morning. We got a, a big program for you. And we're going to begin this morning with the UD Gospel Choir doing our invocation. So guys, take it away. Not bound down soon. We shall not bound down soon. Injustice, we shall not bound down soon. Disorientation, I'm going to stay.
Thank you so much. That was great. And by the way, the Hempstead Jazz Band wasn't too bad either that gave you the free, so right? And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Tim Bees from First Baptist Church, and it's always my honor to be the uh, master of ceremonies for this. So it's good to ha have everybody here. There are some things that, just some thank yous that we need to give out this morning. Uh, the program and the poster, we need to thank Mike Size and Tricia Pitts, who are over at the forum. Is that what we call it still? I can't remember. Did they change the name of that? But anyway. Uh, they are so helpful. They give their time in designing uh, the posters and the brochures for this event, so we give them thanks. Uh, our tech folks this morning, Felicia and Aaron, thank you for being here. This is at least our second year together. You guys do a great job. We're thankful for that. Uh, we've got Robin over here who's making up whatever she's doing. You know, she. <laughs> we were talking about that last night, and... Wait till you see her do the charts for Alex, you know, it's going to be fun. Uh, again, thank you to the Gospel Choir. And then, uh, just so, you know, Faces and Voices is a group of people that works together every year to put this together. And after this event, we turn into chaos mode. And then somehow this thing falls together by this time next year. But Faces and Voices is represented by a number of people from these following uh, organizations within our community. We've got folks who volunteer their time from the Dubu Dubuque Community School District, from Dubuque Human, Human Rights Commission, uh, from First Baptist Church, from the Dubuque Area Congregations United, from John Deere Dubuque Works, from U.S. Bank, and from the Dubuque branch of the NAACP. We are thankful for all these folks who put in their volunteer hours to make this event what it is. Now, there's another group of people that we also need to thank. Uh, we want to acknowledge our city uh, council members for their con continued support of Faces and Voices and this wonderful event. This could not happen if they did not have our backs for this thing. So, Mayor Roy Buell, thank you, Lynn Sutton, uh, Rick Jones, David Resnick, Kevin Lynch, Carla Bragg, and Joyce Connors. If you're here, can you stand uh, so you can be acknowledged? We want to thank you for making this available every year. In my devotions this morning, uh, I, I came across this verse in Mark 10:43. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. Our city council and mayor and those folks certainly serve us, uh, and we're thankful. Mike Van Milligan, too, so thank you. Uh, and I guess I need to do this. Are there any other elected officials in the room other than city council? that you, Could you please stand so that we can acknowledge your presence and give thanks to you? There's Tom. Hey, right? way to go. Thank you. Great. All right, this could go really long, but I want to do, I know that we have some uh, principals, school principals in the room. Could you guys stand, men and women, because you're really important to our community as well. I know you're humble, but can you please stand and thank you. And are there any students in the room? Please stand, because you're our future. I mean, seriously, you're our future, so thank you. So we are up to the, oh, one more thing. Let me just say this. Uh, so there's a lot of information on your table. We got the program. Uh, there's something from the Iowa Child Advocacy Board, which uh, we, I serve on this uh, as, not as a CASA, but I'm on the Foster Care Review Board. Uh, this is really important. We have kids who are, uh, you know, they're kind of in this middle ground and the Iowa Child Advocacy Board meets their needs, makes sure they're in a safe place and it, I, most of you are probably volunteered overtime already, but if you know anybody who might want to serve on, in some capacity through this, this is a really valuable thing. And then the, we also have this thing on the global uh, perspective, the Tom Detterman Award. Uh, he'll give you more information, or this will come along later on, but I just wanted to point that out. Now our community award, we do this every year. Uh, the, what's the qualification? The community award for local business, that's what we're dealing with this year. 
recognizing leadership in the Dubuque community that helps to promote and support events and programs that embrace diversity. The following are the qualifications to get this. The recipient will have demonstrated one or more of the following things. Embracing the Faces and Voices commitment to our community um, by helping to promote and support events and programs featuring diversity. Uh, two, reflecting the Faces and Voices mission to respectfully create a more inclusive, integrated, and welcoming community by celebrating and learning about our connection to the global human experience. And three, coordinating or leading human rights activities in Dubuque. Our award winner this year is Judy Fallhaber, owner of Big Apple Bagel, and she embraces this vision of Faces and Voices uh, Judy worked at Big Apple Bagels for three years. I love these kind of stories. She worked there uh, for three years prior to purchasing the business 14 years ago. She's very involved in making our community one to be proud of. She says, I feel as a business owner, we have a responsibility to give back and bring awareness to our community organizations. She supports many nonprofit organizations, including Opening Doors, which is Maria House and Teresa Shelter, the Rescue Mission, Two by Two, and New Beginnings. Uh, I wanna welcome uh, Judy Fulhaber for all her community work. I talked to her while we were eating. I told her, I'm, whenever I come into your establishment, Big Apple Bagel, I just gotta tell you, I'm always welcomed. The atmosphere is electric. The folks you have hired to work behind the counter have an energy and zeal, and it's really good. Judy, your fingerprint is all over that place, so th why don't you come up? and let us give you this community award. Thank you for your service. There you go, thank you very much. Yep. Good morning. I'm Nancy Van Milligan. I'm the president and CEO of the Community Foundation, and it's our great honor to sponsor this event every year. But this morning, I have a much bigger honor. It is both my honor and pleasure to introduce a man who I am proud to call friend. Tom, Tom Detterman is an educator, and Tom never needed a classroom to teach. His greatest message is how to make this world a fairer and more just place for all people. Tom is here with us today, and I'm going to let him tell you about his extraordinary vision. Tom, please join me. Must have glasses. Well, first of all, thank you all for attending this morning and for I know what will be your investment in the next 364 days of trying to uh, capture the spirit of Dr. King and carry it on every day of the year. I'm here this morning because the card on your table represents something that I care deeply about and that's the, the idea of a global perspectives education. I've tried to uh, represent that in my life as a teacher and as a copley, an informal educator as well. And all of us in this room, some would raise their hand and say, I am a person who works with children every day, five days a week, and they would raise their hand. And the rest of us would, the rest of us would say, I am an informal educator who has the, the chance and the opportunity to work with people, both other adults and with youth to educate them about the nature of our world as well. So, as a result of all that, we uh, began the Thomas Detterman Global Perspectives Endowment, and out of that endowment comes a leadership award, which I am so pumped about giving out money to, to these high school seniors in uh, May of 2014 as the beginning of our scholarship process. 
Um, in addition, beyond the scholarships, we have a bigger goal, and that's to educate further educators in K through 12 um, using a model of global education that will help deliver what I believe is a quality education in the 21st century. And that quality education will come from the fact that all of our students will be in a school that is inclusive in its climate and its culture. All students will be taught cross-cultural skills and all of our students will have a sense of the multicultural nature of our world and all the students will be given a global perspectives education as well. And we can say those, those things are in our documents, they're in our policies, they're in our state standards, but unless they're in our hearts and our souls and our brains, we won't get the job done. And so I'm calling upon all of you to encourage, whether you're an informal or formal educator, encourage that kind of approach as we think about formal school and the learning that we all do, as Einstein said, the, all the learning I did after I left school as well. So what does that all mean? That means that we must, we must in, instill a, in a, a, a perspectives consciousness in all of us. All of us don't come from the same avenue in life. All of us don't share the same beliefs. But as a result of a consciousness of our perspectives, we begin to respect and exchange ideas with people who together, even when we disagree, can make for a fairer, better place for all of us. It also means that we learn how to deal with conflict. And conflict happens all the way from the family level to the global level. And quite honestly, we aren't doing really well in this area in any of those levels. So as far as formal school, a, a skill building approach to having the, the opportunity to uh, use, our, use our, not our fists, but our brains and our mouth to deal with the conflicts we know are gonna be out there. A third theme would be a theme that the city of Dubuque has, I think, courageously stepped up to, and that's the idea of sustainability. We must begin to make sustainable relationships and sustainable institutions and sustainable environment so that we can enjoy all the gifts that we've been given. And I think the old culture said throw it away, the new culture says find a way to use it. And we start with our kids in school. My little granddaughter, Kylan, is already learning about how to recycle. Right, Kylan? In first grade. It also has to do with uh, cross-cultural understanding. And we know until recently, Dubuque wasn't a very culturally diverse place. We now know that we are becoming a culturally diverse place. And the most important thing to, to attack the old stereotypes, the old, uh, I guess they'd call it bigotry. There's still some of that in our town as well. And the institutional racism, sexism, and other kinds of isms that still hang around is for us to take the lead, step out, shake the hand of a person that you've never met before, and learn how to build relationships across cultures, across generations, across racial lines, across ethnic lines, any lines that we have built that don't need to be there anymore. And finally, uh, school, both in and out of school, we need to be teaching about human dignity and human rights. And again, attacking the old mythologies of supremacy versus inferiority and uh, attending movies, quite honestly, about, like 12 Years a Slave. I've challenged all my white brethren to go to that movie because in two hours it'll make you very uncomfortable, but it doesn't come anywhere near making up for 250 years of brutal oppression against African Americans. So I urge you now that it's been nominated, it's gonna be back in our, in our theaters again. I would urge all of you to attend that movie. So how do we do this? We don't do this through a course like the one I taught at Hempstead High School in 1972, and that was called Global Issues. That's a small, small piece. What we do is we infuse this into the K-12 system. Every teacher can be a global educator. Every teacher can be a cross-cultural educator. And we need to do that by making sure that the lessons we teach are taught with the increased content, the enhanced content of what we don't know, because teachers don't teach what teachers don't know. And so we need to level up our knowledge level 
and then the way we do it as well. Are we including kids? Are we engaging kids? Are we getting kids to provoke real questions about the things that they, they care about? And are we giving them a chance to come up with some alternatives? Uh, my rule always was 50-50. 50% of the time, we'll answer the questions. The other 50% of the time, we'll question the answers. And I think that's a really good formula for a good school. So, with all that said, I want to leave you with uh, the same quote that was in the paper this morning. It's my favorite quote from the great soul Gandhi. Be the change you seek in the world. And I hope you'll take a look at the, uh, at the endowment materials on your table. I hope you can invest. I hope you can share it with other people because we have big plans. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. We've made it very easy for you to give to Tom's vision. So on your table is this card, and on the back it shares how you can give to this endowment, where you can actually make a difference, where we can give this leadership award. There are also envelopes, if you choose, to put your gifts in. So today, in memory of Martin Luther King, and in honor of our good friend, Tom Detterman, I ask you to give generously. Your gift will be eligible for what's called the Endow Iowa Tax Credit. So a $100 gift will cost you approximately $40. So I ask you to please give generously. Let's keep Tom's vision alive. Thank you so much. I'm Tom Barton, member of the Dubuque School Board, and I'm honored to be here and proud to introduce our keynote speaker, my friend, Dr. Alex David. I met Alex several years ago at a Wells Fargo meeting. Immediately, I knew I was in the presence of incredible talent. Alex and I share similar stories of growing up poor with single moms. Now, for anybody who's grown up poor with a single mom, you've been through the same conversations. You wind up debating who grew up poorer <laughs> and whose mom was singler. So after Alex and I go back and forth, we, we both agreed that he probably had it a little tougher than me. Uh, West Locust Street by the White House Tavern and Corbett's Grocery Store. Can't quite compete with inner city Brooklyn, but, but it was close. <laughs> Warmth and intelligence, principles and faith, wit and grit. They all come through loud and clear from Alex. Alex is uniquely qualified to speak on Dr. King's dream of economic equality. Who better than a poor kid from a tough Brooklyn neighborhood who worked his butt off to make it big? Alex was an economist and head of the Office for Research and Diversity at the New York City Bar Association. In 2009, he spoke at the White House on behalf of the National Black Chamber of Commerce to discuss regulatory reform and TARP funding and the impact on 100,000 small black businesses, and has also worked with the House of Representatives Ways and Means Committee. He was invited in on several calls with the White House Office of Public Engagement to discuss the unintended consequences government can have on small business. He was asked back to the White House in 2011 to take part in small business solution planning sessions. Dr. Alex David has delivered over 500 economic talks with such groups as the National Bar Association, National Medical Association, the Congressional Black Caucus, and was even the keynote speaker for the annual economic luncheons held at three Super Bowls. Now, you don't have to work all the time, Alex. Call me crazy. Some people go to the Super Bowl to watch football. I'm picturing Alex wandering around at the Super Bowl looking for a good economic luncheon that he can drop in on. 
He's on the executive board of directors of the National Black Chamber of Commerce. He was a guest on the CBS Early Show as an advocate for black business. He's been featured in Forbes magazine. He has two PhDs in economics and marketing. In 2008, he was a recipient of the Network Journal's 40 Under 40 Achievement Award, a virtual who's who of black professionals. He's a proud Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity man. And if that isn't enough, he's featured in the March edition of Ebony. He would have been in this month's Ebony, but I guess he was bumped, uh, bumped out of the copy by Nelson Mandela. So, if, if that, so there's, there, there's no shame in that, Alex, by, by being put off a month. Alex is currently a managing director and head of U.S. branch expansion for Wells Fargo Advisors Financial Network. He leads the success of more than 1,100 independent advisors and $75 billion in client assets, reporting directly to the president. Up at 4.15 a.m. every day, in the gym at 5, at his desk by 6, Alex says this. Every day before mom went to work, she made a pot of oatmeal for our breakfast and cooked our dinner. Her work ethic always inspired me. I will outstudy, outwork, or outtrain anyone on the street. Anyone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here to speak on Dr. Martin Luther King's dream of economic equality, Dr. Alex David. Oh, we got a little close there. Good morning. Thank you, Tom. That was, that was so nice. I, didn't, I really didn't expect that. He said, oh, I'll introduce you. Don't worry about it. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, no, it, it really is a pleasure being here in Dubuque and uh, first time here. And uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. Could you guys hear me pretty well? I'm going to step back forward from this a little bit. Um, so can I ask that we give uh, another round of applause to the students and their parents. This is their day off, and they came out early in the morning, probably when it's dark. I think we owe them one more round of applause. Would you agree? <laughs> Trust me, a day off, I was not trying to come out in the cold to listen to some guy that I've never heard of. So I, we appreciate that. Um, so when Tom asked me to, to come up and, and speak uh, at this, this great event, First thing I thought was, well, okay, so you got a black guy from New York City, uh, currently living in, in St. Louis, and I'm probably going to speak to uh, predominantly an all-white audience. Tom and I, he owns Barton Wealth Management, we're colleagues, but we're also good friends. He's white, I'm black. I was like, that's it. I, I think we accomplished Dr. King's legacy. <laughs> Goodbye and good night. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Um, but it really is, it's good to be here. I wanted to just chat with you all about some things that I think, at least, uh, Tom had a reception at, uh, uh, at his house yesterday, at least it might, um, it might provide some conversation. And I was talking to one, one of the people earlier today, and my thought is, we don't necessarily know whether these conversations will lead anywhere, but if we don't have the conversation, then we, we're kind of lost from the beginning. So at least we'll have some conversation. And, and perhaps it might be provocative, who knows, but that, that stirs up the conversation a little bit. So let me get started. Let me just get the clicker here. Let me start with this, this slide. So when you think of Dr. Martin Luther King, you often think of, when you, when you hear Dr. King, you think of, uh, race relations, his passion around race relations. And that's, that's probably the most dominant uh, uh, theme that you hear or you think of when you, when you hear uh, these phrases or these quotes. They, this was probably one of the most famous. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they'll be judged not by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. A very powerful uh, statement by all means. What about this one? Here's another. In the end, we will not be judged by, will not, uh, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And another, another powerful, powerful statement that, that Dr. King uh, lived by. And these are words that we, we think of. What about this one? 
We must learn to live together as brothers or we'll perish together as fools. So you have quote after quote after quote, I mean these, these powerful quotes that when we think of Dr. King, we think of the race equality balance, right? That continuum that we, we really want everyone to live by. But what's really interesting is, and as a matter of fact, when I, when I, um, I started Googling this information, you know, there are more than 16 million web pages that have Dr. Martin Luther King's quote on them. It's amazing. I Googled that. I was like, I wonder how many quotes. It's probably four or five hundred. Sixteen million. I was like, hmm, which, which, which quote should I use here? <laughs> that took like an hour to decide. Amazing. But it, 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 it shows you how prolific he was. He was an orator. Uh, he really stood out amongst everyone, uh, all, uh, all folks relative to uh, race relations, I, I think, by any means. And we're seeing some of the results of that, I think, right? We have our president. You know, President Obama is the result, I think, of the civil rights movement that started, you know, decades ago. And I think, you know, if uh, Dr. Martin Luther King were alive today, he'd be smiling that we have an African-American president. Not certain whether he thought that it could happen, but, you know, we have made a significant amount of uh, progress lately. And in fact, if you take a look at uh, most schools, I understand that there are, I guess, three or four colleges in this general area. When you take a look at most schools today, by all means, this is what they begin to look like, right? Um, Tom had mentioned, who you all honored today, he had mentioned this whole global perspective and the importance of having a global perspective. Um, this is actually one of the results of that global perspective. And we, we are, we're thankful for Dr. King to be able to see this as a result. It's impacted my life, in fact. I, I thought I'd share this with you. So, let's see. There you go. That's Alex David proposing to his white fiance just a couple of weeks ago. So yes, thank you, Dr. King. I'm very happy about that. When I told her that I was gonna put this up, she's like, really, what, what is that, really? What does that have to do? I was like, well, I just, I'm proud of it. Um, it is, it's exciting though, because it, it, I think we've gotten to the point where um, many times when people think of race relations, uh, they don't necessarily, it, it's almost a foregone conclusion. And I would even say, this would be a great study to, to take a look at. Uh, I actually believe that this thing called hip hop actually has had an incredible significant in how young people look at each other and how they mesh within the culture. It's so, everyone loves Jay-Z, whether you're white, black, Asian, what have you, everyone loves Beyonce. And, and that whole theme, I'm sure someone's gonna, some sociologist or someone's gonna study that, anthropologist or something like that, one day. Because I actually think that, you know, the unintended consequence of what they do has actually had a, uh, had an impact on race relations. So it, it feels as if we made a ton of progress, and I think we have. As I said, I've seen it in my own life. But we still have a, a ways to go. I think we would, we, would, we would agree to that. When we have you know, a, a young man who has a hoodie on, and he's shot, and that probably had some racial overtones there, there are many instances in our state, uh, or not necessarily in our uh, Iowa, I haven't looked at the news, but certainly in the United States, and perhaps even worldwide, where there's racial disparities and perhaps injustices that we've seen, and maybe we need, we, we need to go a little further. And that's, that, that, that is possible. So the whole point of this is to just kind of um, allow you, allow me to kind of walk you through some, some facts and some things about Dr. King uh, and, and then really get to the most important fact, that is. So here's an interesting list of some thoughts about Dr. King. The fact that you know, he was the youngest Nobel uh, Prize winner. I mean, we're honoring him today. Uh, he was only 35 years old when he won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. He's a famous orator, but he actually got a C in public speaking in seminary school. Who would have guessed, right? So for all those kids who got you know, C's and B's, don't worry. 
you can still be as powerful as him. He skipped a couple of grades. His I Have a Dream speech wasn't, you know, the, the first time he was at the, the memorial, the Lincoln Memorial. He is actually the only uh, other person besides George Washington that has a single uh, national holiday uh, after them. I mean, that, that's, those are pretty cool facts. The most important, I think, of all of these, and these are great, obscure, interesting facts you find on the internet, the most important that I really believe is that he actually had a passion around not only racial equality, but economic equality. In fact, those two, they, they tend to go hand in hand. Let me just read you this quote. In 1967, he said, there are 40 million poor people here. And one day, we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? And when you begin to ask that question, you are raising the question about the economic system. That's kind of how he thought. You know, he was a, a civil rights leader, but in many respects, he was a civil and labor rights leader. So there was one, um, there's one gentleman, his name is uh, Chris Hedges, and he was doing kind of like an expose of this whole, this other aspect of Dr. King with regards to uh, his, his thought around the, the economy. And uh, he said, you know, racial justice without uh, economic justice is a farce. They can't go hand in hand. You can't have someone uh, to, uh, you know, be considered equal without access to the equal place. So let me just take a step back when I, and describe what I think of as uh, equality, or economic equality. Oftentimes, people immediately think, oh, well, he's pushing you know, the socialist environment or income distribution, and it's not that. And I, I understand those arguments, it's not that. What I'm referring to is what I think Dr. King referred to, and that is access to the economic system. So without access, then, you know, that's it. If you can at least open the door for me. If you open the door for me, and I think many people think this way, I'll run through it, and I'm gonna drive, I'm gonna drive hard. But if the door is not open, then, then it becomes highly uh, difficult and basically almost impossible. So the economic equality that Dr. King uh, believed in, and he embodied, and what he was passionate about was really about access to these things. Um, this one gentleman, um, Michael Honey, I think it's up there, yeah, uh, he kind of looked at it as two phases, you know, the Voting and Civil Rights Act and then this economic justice for all. Let me just read to you one other thought that Dr. King said. He said, and this is when he was speaking at, at a, um, at, I guess during a strike in 1968, he says, now our struggle is for genuine equality, which means economic equality. And then went on to say, for we know that it isn't enough to integrate lunch counters, because what does it profit a man to be able to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he doesn't earn enough money to buy the hamburger? He said, what does it profit one to be able to attend an integrated school when he doesn't earn enough to buy his kids the school lunches. He linked those two. They, they were almost indelibly linked together. Racial equality and at least access to the economic system. So, there's one thought that we can't necessarily see the future, and I'm certain that he didn't either. But you can often see the present with extreme clarity. So let's, let's think about some of the things that we see from an economic perspective uh, and see how clear Dr. King's passion or his legacy was. So I don't want you guys to get afraid, <laughs> but this is there's something called the Gini coefficient. And we were speaking about this yesterday. I said, you think you can, uh, you can do those, that derivation on a sign? And, and so I'm not certain where you can do that. This is, this is a very important um, economic e equation discovered, I guess it was published in 1912 or so. It's called the Gini coefficient. And basically, it's a statistical um, uh, uh, equation 
that accounts for the dispersion in income, the wealth gap, if you will. You guys probably have heard that. So I kind of put a pictorial there to show you effectively what it is. We have people sleeping on the street, and then we have people like bathing in money. You know, and so that, so that equation basically describes that gap. So it's called the Gini coefficient, the Gini index, uh, and many times countries, regions, states, they are assessed on their wealth gap, right? So zero would mean, hey, there is, everyone is basically the same. Everyone has full access to the best education and jobs and opportunities and people and networks, and that's a zero. So anything, you know, slightly higher than that means that there is, there's a, a gap that continues, you know, down that, down that path. So let me just show you an idea give me an idea of what the United States looks like. So this is the world. And for the most part, most, um, most developed countries, they have seen their Gini coefficient, their gap uh, increase. Up until the 70s, it was pretty stable. But from that point on, it began to uh, increase. And unfortunately for the United States, for the United States, the gap has actually increased the most. So that's an interesting perspective because we actually had the, the, the true civil rights struggle, and we kind of began to make progress, but unfortunately, the gap has increased rather significantly. So it's something for us to, to kind of think about and, and consider. Let me go on to the next slide here. This really gives you kind of the, I think, not to make this a, an economics class, but this is an important piece. Because this begins to show you some of the, um, th those variables that go into that equation. Things like unemployment, right, go into that. So when we see a huge gap, I guess, you see that huge mountain all the way at the top there? That was the largest gap between uh, blacks and whites. That was in, I think, 1983 or so. So if you remember, that there was probably in the early 80s is when we began to see a significant amount of offshoring. And so perhaps even you all might have been uh, victims of that. You know, factories, manufacturing jobs begin to go offshore. And that gap began to get wide and wide. That was the largest gap since they began to collect this data uh, in that time period. Interestingly enough, in 2009, I think that's 2009, that gap got extremely small. There was only a small difference between Afri uh, um, uh, African Americans and white in terms of the unemployment rates. Now, the unemployment rates, they went sky high, but if you start thinking into this, probably one of the reasons why uh, was because, you know, all these folks in the home office, Tom, sorry, <laughs> those folks in, on Wall Street and many of these, these other institutions, they were laid off, you know, and so, there are many folks that still had their jobs, although perhaps lower paying jobs, and um, that gap got really tiny. So it's kind of almost, almost counterintuitive to think that, you know, during a recession, the, the wealth gap or the, the unemployment gap w would shrink. Unfortunately now, it's beginning to widen a, a bit. And, and uh, it's my, my thought process that I'm not certain will it, whether it will be as high as that first mountain um, because I think, you know, companies have said, well, we had six levels of executive managers and now we had, you know, 15 senior VPs. Maybe we really only need six of them. So, you know, those folks at that level probably need to retool and kind of think about, you know, where they are and where they're going. But it's just one example of, you know, one of the variables that go into that equation, that, that Gini index, to see what the gap is, the, the equality or the inequality that Dr. King was passionate about. Another is the poverty rate. Same deal. You know, we, we see that there's a difference between the African American and uh, white poverty rate. For the most part, throughout the United States, the African American poverty rate is about 28 percent. Um, the uh, uh, white poverty rate uh, is, tends to be around 12 percent or so, you know, those living under the poverty, poverty level. Let's perhaps take this home to what might be happening in the state of Iowa. I'm not certain what might be happening in Dubuque, but in the state of Iowa, this is important. So 18.7% unemployment for African Americans who live in Iowa, compared to Iowa State is, I guess, six, six and change or something like that. So relative to the United States, 
uh, in terms of unemployment, the, light, the latest data that I, I, I've seen says that, hey, Iowa is actually making progress um, quicker than the United States. That's good, but we still have a gap. You know, we, we still have some challenges for us to all think about, right? In terms of the poverty rate. Now, again, I, I received this data from the Iowa Data Center, and so this is an organization that I, I believe is uh, nonpartisan. But this is an important um, piece as well. The poverty rate, 12.8% versus African American, 41%. So it does help us to see that there is still a gap, still things that we can do. You know, we still have some things that you know, we, can all, we can all work on. Because at the end of the day, it really is, I guess we need to always ask ourselves, to what extent are people of color or folks that have been victims of uh, any isms, as Tom mentioned, to what extent are they having the same access as everyone else? That's, that's kind of the mind frame. That's where Dr. King was going when he looked at you know, racial equality and economic equality. This is just a quick uh, sampling of where Iowa is in terms of, of that uh, Gini coefficient. 0.427. The good news is, if you take a city like New York City, I'm, I'm from New York City, and my buddy joined me from New York City as well, um, it's like 0.51. I mean, there's a huge gap there between you know, those who have access and those who don't. I mean, it really is. You, you could probably go in New York City and see someone on the street, and then on Park Avenue, someone is probably bathing in money in their bathtub. I mean, you, that would not be a weird thing to see or even hear about. In Iowa, actually, you guys do significantly better than uh, the United States with regards to this gap, although we, we mentioned some of the things, some of the challenges that you have. So the good news is, uh, relative to most of the you know, contiguous states, you guys are way ahead of it. Um, the challenging news is we still, have, we still have a ways to go, right? And I think Dr. King, if he were standing here, certainly I wouldn't be standing here, but if he, <laughs> but, you know, he, he would certainly say, uh, in that, in that, that baritone, you know, reverend type tone, hey, I'm proud of you all, but I still have a dream that you can go further. I, I think he'd say something like that. So, what are the things that we can uh, consider doing as a group? What can we consider uh, thinking about? Well, I actually believe that this is not a problem that one person or one politician or one, you know, party, or one, you know, group can solve. I actually think that several people are involved. Probably all of us are involved in this. As an example, so if you're in the group and you have family members, or perhaps you yourself might be in a situation where you are technically considered, you know, low income or, or you know, at that, that bottom rung. Consider this. This is a, a wildly crazy thought consider the minimum wage job. And it's like, did, did, he, did he just advocate minimum wage job? And I know there's a lot of controversy about that, which I'll get to in a second. But most people don't realize that very successful folks started at minimum wage jobs. In fact, there was this really interesting article that I, that I read that 62% of McDonald's owners, and I think most folks would say those franchisees are you know, successful, they actually held minimum wage jobs at McDonald's. That's, that's, that's a powerful thing. So if you're in that category, certainly you don't want to be there. I mean, it, it's, it's obvious. Everyone would like to, to have more. But if the choices are, let's see, unemployment or let's say the minimum wage job, then I would encourage folks to choose a minimum wage job. Now, you might be thinking, Alex, of course someone's going to choose a minimum wage job. One of the things that... Uh, 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 President Obama have said, well, folks, if they had the choice between, between uh, working or, you know, just getting an unemployment insurance check, of course they're going to choose work. And that's what I would think also. But I actually polled some of my own family members and said, well, if they extended the unemployment insurance, would, would you continue? And they like, and, and literally I was like, huh, that's not really what I was, I, was, I, was, I was thinking that you'd answer. But they were like, yeah, why not? And, I, and I, was, I was thinking that, let me just take this, this quick second to explain my, my view of this. 
When you look at unemployment, and this is the, this is the piece of that um, uh, conversation around inequality. When you look at unemployment, and all those, you know, uh, government, quote unquote, the handouts, it's not really handout, but you know, the, the things that we put, as the, the social safety net, right? It acts as a social safety net. I'm walking along, and I, I have my, my, my job, I'm laid off or I'm fired, I fall off, there's a net to catch me called unemployment insurance. I love it. I have a net so that I don't kill myself. The whole purpose though of the net is not to kind of just hang out there and just chill out and I'll just, I'll just hang out in the net now, now that I'm here. The whole purpose is you know, to walk along, get back on the ladder, so that I can go back on that line again. Like that's, that's, that's a true safety net in any means. I mean, it should be you know, soft enough so I don't kill myself, but hard enough and, and uncomfortable enough so that it inspires me to, oh boy, I, I gotta do this work thing because just laying here isn't fun. That's just my thought on that. On that. Um, in terms of the, the Chamber of Commerce, I was speaking with one of the members of the Chamber of Commerce last night at Tom's house. And um, I actually think there's, a, there's an important piece that they, they play in uh, access to uh, the economic um, parity, if you will. And that is, there's this thing called search frictions. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a gentleman that won the uh, Nobel Prize in economics that spoke about this. Search frictions are when you have jobs over here open, so we have businesses that are ready to hire people, and then you have folks that really want to work. And for some reason, those two groups, they, they can't get together. They can't find each other. There are all these hurdles. For some reason, they can't meet. In fact, more than three million jobs, almost four million jobs in the United States in 2013, where we have some of the highest um, post-World War II economic numbers in terms of unemployment, when we had such high numbers, there were four million open jobs where businesses could not find employees. So I would say the onus from that perspective uh, might be on the Chamber of Commerce and, and folks like that to look and say what can we do to make sure that we have people, we have companies, we have small businesses that have these jobs open that they can do, we can do as much as we possibly can to make sure that those groups meet. And I think they were doing some fantastic innovative things to make sure that that happens. So it seems as if they, they might have seen some of my slides and, no, I'm just kidding. They, it seems like they, they're certainly on the, on the right path. Um, in terms of, you know, some of our, our policymakers, I, I know that well, we have some here locally uh, in the state, a mayor and so on and so forth. They do a fun, fun, phenomenal job. They have a very difficult job, but I would still say it's still, um, the onus is, continues to be on them because at the end of the day, when we think of, I actually think, let me just go back to minimum wage for a second, and perhaps when I, I read all the, 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 the data as well as the history of Dr. Martin Luther King and how he thought about things, he really believed in supporting unions, but he also believed in holding them accountable. And so he had a very interesting perspective because folks might have said, well, he was, he was always pro-union, and in many instances, he absolutely was because there was a particular purpose he was trying to get across, but he also said, hey, this is, this is what you should be doing as well. So when it comes down to you know, policies that are put in place on behalf of those that are trying to get access to the economic uh, system, as Dr. King would have wanted, I would think that we'd like to, you, we might need to raise the minimum wage or so on and so forth, but if we raise it so high, then you know, those businesses won't be able to hire them, so it's almost, indirected, uh, uh, unintended, it's almost like a discrimination against the very people we're trying to help. We don't, we don't want that. But if we, 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 com we uh, combined the whole minimum wage, maybe increasing that a little bit, with retooling, this whole teaching aspect. So if someone le loses their job, what if there is a, an entire system wrapped around them to say, here's your unemployment insurance, here's a job, and here is the education that you can use to retool. Because what tends to happen is if I'm making $40,000 a year and I lose my job and I get a job, now I'm paying $20,000 a year. Okay, well, that's, that's not fun, but I, I've got to support my family. Sometimes the first thing that folks do, particularly if they have a very strong work, work ethic like we do here in the Midwest, they say, well, you know what, I'll take on two jobs. 
I'll take on two $20,000 jobs and now I'm back at my standard. That seems logical, but unfortunately it becomes an endless cycle. And so now you never really have the time because you're so exhausted, you never have the time to retool. You never have the time to go back and get a better education and to learn a vocation that is up to date with what's going on. And so unfortunately, you just see yourself in that cycle over and over and over again and you realize five, six, seven years have passed and I, I just, I never got back to where I wanted to be. Instead of perhaps taking the job and combining that with education so that I'm now ready. Perhaps from a global perspective, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 opportunity. I mean, there are many, many, many companies that look to the United States to have, you know, folks that we would consider uh, middle level education. They, they love to have those folks. They just happen not to be, you know, perhaps in Dubuque. They happen not to be in the United States, perhaps. And so to what extent are we willing to take a chance on ourselves? Because we always ask folks, take a chance on me. Yeah, just, just give me a shot. And I always say, to what extent are we willing to take a chance on ourselves? And sometimes that might mean relocating. But that, that's a whole different discussion. It's just something for us to ultimately think about. And in terms of voters and consumers, I mean, at the end of the day, you do rule. At the end of the day, you can say, I really like you as a person. I don't like your policy decisions. I might need to vote against you. Or I really like you as a, as a, as a retail store. I don't like some of the things you're doing. I might need to go to another resale. You always have that choice. And Harvard, there's a great Harvard study that said the more diverse an executive team is that folks making those decisions, invariably, the more diverse or heterogeneous that team is relative to a homogeneous team, they make better decisions time after time after time. It's, it's a powerful study. It's the best case for corporate diversity. It's the best case for, I think, political diversity, and certainly the best case for um, company uh, diversity, even on the, the local front. So at the end of the day, we have uh, very, very strong capabilities, right? It's all about the things that we can offer. One plus one does equal three. I, I, I believe that, you know, it's us, me helping John, John helping Susie, and before you know it, it's not, it's not a, um, uh, a direct equation. I mean, it really becomes exponential. And we should probably at least consider imitating Dr. King's faith. You know, the faith is a assured expectation of things hoped for, the evident demonstration of realities, though not beheld. That's what he saw. The evident demonstration of these things happening, but they, he, he said, hey, I, I might not be able to see it right now or be there with you, but uh, I, I see it at some point. The evident demonstrations, he saw that, uh, though it wasn't in, you know, in his, his exact reality. Because at the end of the day, I'll leave you with this. This is what he said. He said, if we can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, this is really for all of us. Whatever you do, keep moving forward. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. My name is Beth McCaw, and I'm the pastor to students at the University of Dubuque. 
And I'm thinking about how good God is to surround us with community and voices that challenge and inspire us on what can be. It is a gift this morning to gather and hear from Dr. David. It is a gift to gather this morning and recall the voice and the vision of Dr. King. And as we go out this morning, I want to give you a snapshot from another prophet, an ancient prophet, the prophet Isaiah from the Bible, who gave us a vision for um, God's economy, if you will, the kingdom of God. And in the Bible, it lays this out as the kingdom of God being a community where all lives are lived fully with not just enough, but with abundance. A community in which everyone is building homes and dwelling in them securely. A community in which everyone is sowing and savoring the harvest. A community in which everyone is enjoying the fruits of their vocation, their calling, their life's work. A community in which we are raising the children, the next generation, not in a time of despair, but in a season of promise. This is a snapshot of the kingdom of God, what God wants to be bringing about. So as we go out this morning, let us go as people who have heard that the kingdom is at hand. Live just and courageous lives. Live generous and hopeful lives. Bear witness in small ways and in large ways to the fullness of life that God intends for every person. And as you go, receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today and always. Amen. Is this song? Yes, great. We've been challenged. We've been blessed. Go then. Walk, run, crawl, whatever. Let's move forward. Thanks for attending. You are dismissed. Take care.